Let's start with the one in the middle. Uh, it talks about a partnership between Ericsson and Philips. You guys know each other? Woohoo! Yes, of course. Okay, tell us a bit about it. Why is there a chart that describes this need for connectivity and how a lighting company and equipment company find common ground to solve this problem? What are you guys doing? What are you talking about? I put you on the opposite ends of each other so you awesome. can yes. fight over the microphone. <laughs> I hardly see Brian. Okay. <laughs> You so to I'm going to come back and uh, this, this, I'll come back to your picture in a second, but let's start by saying this is uh, Christoph Herzig, who's the general manager of Philips Lighting and the head of this partnership, right? Yeah, that's the point, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what that means to be the head of the partnership, but partners are usually partners. They're not heads. But anyway, Brenda uh, 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 Connor is the head of Smart Cities for Ericsson North America. Yes. So how do you guys come together to solve this problem, to address this problem? Well, let me, uh, if you allow, Brenda. Um, I, in 2013, my former job has been the global marketing manager for outdoor lighting systems and services. And we've been looking uh, very closely at what else is possible with the street lighting infrastructure going through this tremendous transformation from analog lighting, incandescent light bulb that needs to be exchanged every three years, to LED lighting which is instantly dimmable, it's going to be connected. And we understand that it has a tremendous potential, right? Because it has all these ubiquitous locations across the city, has power in the US, power is on during the day, and it has the height, which gives a tremendous opportunity. So we've been looking very strategically on what else we can do. And then we found in Ericsson a fantastic partner, very much like Philips, uh, uh, you know, a blue chip from Europe, more than 100 years old research um, background, and we found, we found a common ground very soon that the small cell densification of the f upcoming LTE networks at that time was a perfect opportunity to work together. And uh, so we, we sat down and we created the concept of the smart pole allowing to deploy LTE networks much faster in a city-friendly way. And this is what we have been doing for the last uh, three years. And uh, we're going nationwide, we're going global, and I can talk a bit about the, the work we have been doing for the last two years. So Brenda, from your perspective then, why would you go to a, a street light vendor uh, in order to help solve the densification problem of your customers? Well, I think it's a bigger picture than that. For 140 years, and thanks for recognizing we've been around more longer than I have, for 140 years, Ericsson, has been leading uh, in open innovation and in enabling change, uh, providing technology that en enables change agents to find new use cases to the problems that exist out there. So when you look at the uh, street lighting and you look at the need for densification, you have to also step back and say every operator known to man goes to the city and says, hey man, I'd like to put a street, you know, a small cell on your pole on the same corner right and then you get into the aesthetics and how do we hide these things inside so when it comes to how do you then deploy these things practically in a way pleasing to the citizens as well as to the municipalities the ability to put the small cells in a packaging inside providing packaging services and then also then providing the certification services to work with every operator out there, which of course we have excellent relationships with over 140 operators globally to help take Philips who are experts on lighting and take them into that mobile world. And then of course there's the deployment services. When you wanna deploy a small cell inside, there's all kinds of regulations, there's different certifications that are needed. And so being able to then take the optimization after it's integrated as well. These are all services and capabilities, technologies and services that Ericsson provides that supplement very well the, the deep confidence that Philips have in lighting in other areas. So we actually welcome uh, that partnership and uh, we think we announced it rather publicly, didn't we? Oh, well, absolutely, absolutely. So Al, while you're standing, sitting here in the front row, what's this thing here? <laughs> Wi-Fi at a given speed at around 300 feet from the kiosks. It also has a tablet on the kiosk. 
like what that guy's doing over there? So in fact, it's a billboard. In fact, it could be a billboard. Yeah. In a way, it's public advertising, right? It's an electronic signage. But it happens to also be a Wi-Fi access point and could easily be a small cell if somebody stuck one in there. It's designed to accommodate that. It is. OK, great. Erwin, you want to tell us about this? What is your role in all this? Sure, so Civic is the one that actually uh, developed the hardware that you see there, uh, putting the pieces together. I think it goes a little bit before, beyond an advertising piece of hardware as it drives citizen engagement as well. There is a panel where you can interact with the device and with the city. We can start running apps on that so you can have specific uh, interactions based on where you are. and. It's, it's something that is very, will become very locally aware based on where it is. So people can, can get information about where they are and how they get from A to B, what's available around them. Now what is an important piece of course is it's an almost, or it will be in New York, on almost every single street corner. So that blankets the city and it becomes part of the neighborhood. It becomes part of the way the city is interacting with the citizens and the citizens with the city. And I think that is where it's groundbreaking and maybe differentiates itself from other activities that have been going on about providing Wi-Fi in cities and so forth. So Erwin, you manufacture these, you design these? Correct. Okay. But you're not the franchisee, you're not the service provider that's partnered with the city of New York, are you? We, we, there is a, an organization called City Bridge. City Bridge consists of three companies, Qualcomm, Civic, uh, and Intersection, and we provide the services to City Bridge that puts it on the streets in New York. Okay, so you're part of the City Bridge Consortium, so to speak. Correct. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Now, in fact, if I go back to this picture, um, he's not interacting with the large screen, He's interacting with a small tablet that's part of the, the kiosk. Is it iOS or, or Android? This is Android. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. But he's also emanating Wi-Fi. So if he happened to have his cell phone, he could easily be connected that way. He doesn't need to use that touch screen or the, or, or, or the device itself, right? Absolutely. And, and what's the range? So it's... What, what, what Al just said is about 300 feet away right. from Wi -Fi the device. Uh, it, it, it is something that goes more horizontal, not up. So it spreads across the city. Yeah. I took the bus. Uh, I used to live in New York when this was being installed, moved to Boston. But now, now they kick you out, right? They kicked me out. Yes, I was using <laughs> up all the Wi-Fi. Uh, but I took the bus after a presentation at the UN. And I used to live on the Upper East Side. So I took the bus all the way down Third Avenue. And I was connected except for one point where they haven't installed the, the, the link yet because of construction work. And I was streaming a movie. That was the whole purpose. I wanted to test it works, and it works. But that was on what avenue? Third Avenue. OK. But if I happen to be on Fifth Avenue, it wouldn't work. Not yet, but it's going to blanket the city. 7,500 devices is going to make sure there will be ones on Fifth Avenue, too. But if I'm in Staten Island, it's not going to bother Oh, Staten Island will be covered, too. Oh, really? And the Bronx. You guys are ambitious. And Brooklyn. Absolutely. Cool. This is a great initiative by the city. And this they is obviously just in New York, right? You're only going to do this in New York. Yes, in the five boroughs of New York for this. But the project continues. We are currently closing another city. And you'll see, actually, the device for the other city is different. Um, we actually listen to citizens. There is not a phone booth replacement like we have in New York. It's actually focused more on the interactivity. So one of the large screens is fully touch enabled. So you get one of the large screens to interact with, uh, while the other screen keeps cycling through different advertisements. And when the other touch screen is not being used, it will do the same. 
The advertisements are important because it makes sure the city doesn't have to pay anything for this, and we share in the revenues that are generated uh, through the advertising. And who buys these things? Cities do. Cities pay for them. No, that's, that's, that's different. So the cities engage these projects, and the media, so the advertising that we run on them, that actually pays for it. Okay, cool, cool. So in a way, I describe this as digital signage. Um, you could also call it street furniture. Sure. Right? Right? And my guess is that you could also build a bus shelter around it, right? Yes, and by the way, we call it smartscapes, just a new word to add to the vocab. Cool, there. cool. Yes. So what's this thing up here? So that is more digital signage. Um, but can be a link. But it doesn't have your brand on it. No, it doesn't. Who's so brand this is, is that? This is uh, by one of the other companies that is part of the he Civic Group. He happens to be sitting next to you. Say hello to him. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, so I will pass on the microphone. <laughs> he asked you that. <laughs> so go ahead, Jim. We're talking about the upper right-hand picture over here, right? That's one of your this gates. Is a, this is a, a, a bus shelter. And I believe it's uh, similar, if not the same, as what's being deployed in Paris. Uh, it yes. has been deployed in Paris fairly in recently. In fact, that could be Paris, because it, it be. kind of looks like Paris. But the point is, it's the same kind of device as this, in a way, right? It's an ad, it's a, it's a outdoor signage, digital signage, built into a bus shelter. Right. The, the, uh, the relationship J.C. Deco has with cities is through concession agreements, and there's 3,700 such agreements around the world. J.C. Deco has over a million street furniture assets in uh, a number of locations, and, uh, and each concession agreement is worked with the municipality, not just the administration, but the city council and the representatives, to or arrange things at such a, such a point in time that are consistent with the policies and uh, needs of the city. So uh, in many cases, the, uh, the advertising currently is traditional paper advertising, but in new concessions, there's the uh, ability to Im implement digital in a way that's consistent with safety and other requirements that a city might have. So and, you wouldn't and, show a movie on there? You, you would not show a movie, although you could, or, or you could, if, if it were a digital asset, uh, then depending upon the, uh, the requirements in the municipality, you may or may not be able to show live, advertise, uh, live media. Mm -hmm. uh, th that's a, a process that one has to go through. Right, but the other unique thing about it, is it, is it offer Wi-Fi? It, 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 it can be, although it's typically not. Okay. Uh, I mean, we're, uh, we, we, we can use uh, fiber, we can use Wi-Fi if it's available, or we could use a 4G connection. But it doesn't offer people Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi connectivity access. That's, that's a different element. I think the, the, the thing that's occurred in uh, J.C. Deco's business just uh, is that about three or four years ago, the company looked at, uh, the, the, because of requests from mobile and network operators initially for sites, looked at uh, the possibility of getting dual use of their assets in all these kinds of locations that I mentioned. But what's occurred in the past four years, in addition to mobile network operators being interested in 4G and eventually 5G sites, is the advent of digital advertising and uh, and, and also the advent of city services like, we're, like that were discussed in the previous panel. So those three things have come together to uh, sort of make the requirement that connectivity associated with at least deco street furniture, probably not, certainly not exclusively, is an essential element now. It's, I almost uh, equate it to a franchise obligation that you, ha you have to have a way to working with the city, have connectivity to support all three of those things. Mm -hmm. And the implementation varies by city. Some cities 
may be more interested in Wi-Fi than they are uh, smart city services for whatever reason. And the, and the densification efforts of the carriers vary city by city uh, at any one point in time. So in fact, the cities play a big role in determining how these uh, the, the signage will be used. The, the, uh, the principle of the DECO business is to partner <coughs> with cities. They've done it for over 50 years where they originally traded the opportunity to advertise for by providing a service to the city, a transit system, for instance. Uh, 2,100 bus shelters in Chicago, which is an essential element of services. 3,300 bus shelters in, in uh, New York City. So. We, we partner with the city. We are a concession holder. We have rights and obligations mm -hmm. and so on. So it starts from there. And then, then you see what are the other amenities or capabilities as technology improves, as services become required to enhance that. So Irwin's company designed and makes the, uh, the uh, uh, kiosks right. that are in New York. Is your company also designing and manufacturing your devices? We, we, design, we design the sites, uh, and with over a million uh, assets in 3,700 cities, I think we have 140 uh, R&D. We, we have an R&D shop outside of Paris. But you have suppliers, third I'm parties? Sorry? You have third party suppliers who make these uh, devices? Well, we, we typically organize them as a kit of parts. Frankly, but but the de the designs are deco designs, unless it's an asset that we've acquired through an acquisition, and but even where we've done acquisitions, we've ended up uh, making approved modifications to to improve over time the the function and the performance of the. Now, asset. let's say so, I wanted to put a small cell in there. Could I do that? You you certainly could, and in fact, uh, part of what we've been working on the past few years is. Uh, looking at how to, particularly with new asset designs, uh, working with every major OEM, in fact, in several antenna manufacturers and some other industry partners in our R&D center where we have 140 engineers and R&D developers, anticipate the nature of the, of the technology and how it could be integrated uh, aesthetically, efficiently, and cost effectively into the assets. As a, a related matter though, on existing assets, we work with the operator and then eventually present to the city a, a recommended approach that is, that's aesthetic where we have existing assets in the field. Great. So Brenda, I'm gonna to turn to you now. Ericsson obviously has a major role to play in the densification of cellular networks and in the, uh, let's say, connectivity within the smart city uh, environment. Um, and you look across the range of, t of potential assets that you could make use of, whether they're light posts with Philips, whether they're kiosks, whether they're bus shelters. What are the most important urban uh, infrastructures that you could work closely with to integrate uh, cellular technology into them? Well, thanks for the question. And absolutely, it's an important area for Ericsson, but I'd say it's all of them. And, and really, it's stepping back and looking at it from the perspective of the city, yep. right? The city, look at a city. They have several mobile operators who want to put a small cell somewhere. They have sensors that they want to get connected. They have citizens that they want to help bridge the digital divide, right, and lower those barriers for the folks to move up those ladders of opportunity. So they're really starting to step back and look at things more holistically. And you even see within cities a transformation within the government entities to centralize the decision making for purchases that are related to small cells. Because you have to have small cells, Wi-Fi, how do you put those together and provide the grade of service that they could also then leverage that network for their own sensors. Right? And is it Ericsson's role then to be the middleman between the city and AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, et cetera. Are you intermediary there or do you just give the technology? I'd say we're more partnership enablers, right? Because really seriously in smart cities, there's a public-private partnership almost always, right? 
And so in doing that, we act as sometimes we're partners, sometimes we're intermediaries, sometimes we're the behind the scene guys. We work in a very flexible way in order to meet the challenges of solving real business problems. So we look at it from an outside in. There's business problems that need to get solved. What are the ways in which they can be solved? Who are the incumbents? And how do these come together in a way that provides measurable results for both the, the city officials as well as the citizens and visitors to that community? Because both angles need to see the benefit of whatever you're doing or it doesn't fly. Cool. And the flexible business models are very interesting because you saw these advertising-based models. The real differentiator is the business model that's put forth to lower the barriers for cities to engage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it wasn't for the advertising revenue, they'd have a hard time paying for the equipment, for sure. So I'm sure Philips is working on embedding advertising in your light posts, right? No, we would love to, but um, <laughs> um, it's just missing the visual component, and uh, you could we just, just like to stick to the light from the light, right? Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, holographic yeah. images. Great ideas. I think we have a patent on that. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the point is really that we, we focus so much on the lighting because it has a tremendous opportunity by itself. Going to LED lighting, you, a city can save uh, up to 60% on energy cost per year from the general funds. And going to connected, smart connected lighting, you can dim, you can add another 20%. So these are, you know, really hard benefits. However, the initial investment for such a flip over are significant. You want to touch your infrastructure once. You want to plan it out in a way that you um, understand what other applications you want. And we are actually a big promoter to say, if you want to have a smart connected city, start with smart lighting. It's a great application with all the hard benefits to start with. But secondly, uh, it's also an enabler for others. And if you want other applications to connect, build out the networks, create the conditions for the mobile carriers, for example, or other operators to come in and build the networks for the future. And um, this is actually an argument that we have been using, and we always start from the top with the elected officials. And we have great success in Los Angeles and, and San Jose, which is significant because they're two different models. It's uh, LA is a strong mayor system, so he appoints his staff, very much like New York. But San Jose is a weak mayor model. That has nothing to do with the personality, but the mayor is actually one of 13 council members. So every decision has to go through the council, and the same goes for staff decisions. Now, we have found a way to uh, position our arguments, our benefits for putting the smart poll out there, working with Philips in a public-private partnership to make the benefits work for both sides, the mobile carriers as well as for uh, the city. And it's actually not about the revenues, it's all the other things that come with a connected and smart connected city, uh, which deliver jobs, which, which creates uh, livability, which um, uh, enables GDP growth. And we have seen this in many studies. And uh, so the initial story is upgrade your LED lighting and upgrade your networks at the same time, but then all the other benefits uh, start to uh, appear and uh, the initial idea of generating lots of revenues from the infrastructure is suddenly a second um, priority. And it allows us to do this in a very sustainable way. Do you sell smart lighting without small cells? A lot, yes. A lot. Uh, globally. Um, still, the um, adoption rate is not as fast as we would like to see it. It comes with the hefty investment and many, many different priorities that you have, right? Uh, city leaders uh, might decide that water is a bigger, uh, sanitation is a bigger priority, and then come street lighting with, with a great business case, but not great enough. So well, we actually help is, to, to pull it over. What yeah. you should do is charge people to turn the light on every time they go by this street pole. So you, uh, if they want lights, they have to pay for it, right? Well, even that idea was uh, uh, invented in Los Angeles. I don't know if you know, but <laughs> Los Angeles has a street light, they have a street lighting tax. <laughs> since the 1930s, and that is actually the reason why uh, all the developments in the 30s and 40s, Mulholland Drive, are pitch dark, because the, the new owners didn't want to pay for the lighting in front of their houses. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely true. Well, uh, that's great. Well, I, we in, if I can jump in, Chris brought up a very good point, is that when cities are transforming themselves, there's an anchor use case that they center around, whether it's improving the lighting or whether it's improving the water. And then where Ericsson 
dovetails nicely with our partners because we have partners in the water and partner in the lightning is in providing value across the silos, right? So you can transform data into information for intelligent insight and real-time actioning across the silos. In some of the cities we've done in Brazil, for example, they look at safety being an issue and so putting smart lighting into the parking lots where people are parking their cars and also putting in par smart parking. And you say, well, how do these two things come together in the same parking lot is because now they can dispatch one truck and have that one workforce dispatch change lights in the lighting system and the little LEDs that tell you if there's a car parked or not at the same time. So the OPEX savings, because cities need to have financial sustainability of whatever smart project they put in there, right? So how can they bridge across these silos to bring in the OPEX savings so they take those tax dollars and repurpose them for more smart things? So right? in fact, you know, one of those priorities may be putting in bus shelters. Yes. And you know, that also requires an investment. Is that an investment that's made by JC DeCal on behalf of the city in return for the advertising revenue? Is that how it works? JC DeCal, in consultation with the city and the council and the neighborhoods, designs the assets, whether they're bus shelters or large pillar kiosks or city panels, we design them, we uh, install them, we maintain them, we, we make the entire investment. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's through that then that we uh, get, get an opportunity to share in the advertising revenue or any other revenue that may be available uh, you know, with, with the city. Mm -hmm. But, but it's mean, not an insignificant, I mean, just, yeah, just of as, course. as, as Brenda's saying, it, it's, it's not an insignificant investment to do that, which requires a great deal of planning and, and uh, not something that the company does uh, you know, in every city. It's where the conditions are right and the partnerships can be developed. But typically it's done through uh, public RFPs, which is interesting. But what distinguishes the traditional digital signage from one that is connectivity centric is that there's a backhaul built in and there's, there's space to house the small cell equipment. Um, when you actually deploy that, can it only support one carrier at each site or can it support multiple carriers? Typically it can support more than one carrier, uh, partly because of the footprint that the assets that we build and manage um, you know, under the auspices of the cities, the, 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 the footprint that we have, there's ways of integrating the technology and working cooperatively with the carriers where we act as the neutral the neutral party in the affair uh, of, of sharing. So we typically can support more than one operator, which in that sense complements the things that the city's doing, where the city has limits to one, perhaps at a location, maybe one carrier can be on a pole. We may have a complementary asset that could complement that, which helps uh, more, more proliferation of, of networks. Erwin, I want to uh, put you side by side for a moment and, and I know in, in, in New York City's case the, the goal was to replace payphones and you said in some other cases there aren't payphone assets involved. Um, in fact there are freestanding uh, kiosks that will be deployed for various purposes. What are those use cases and if you're not required to replace payphones what exactly are you putting the kiosk on to create the backhaul and the power to make it possible. I mean, the pre-existing uh, payphone helps to get that started, right? In New York, yes, some other cities too. But the objective of, of this is to actually create connectivity and interaction, so citizen engagement. Um, we're looking at the future where cities will be digitized much more than they are today. What does it mean? Everything will connect to everything else. Your car, your watch, as Apple just launched its new watch today, uh, or anything really on the streets. And as Secretary Fox has said earlier this year, all cars coming off the production line in the United States need to be enabled to communicate with other vehicles and infrastructure. So in a way, this whole connectivity becomes key. And whether that then runs through light poles, bus shelters, or the smartscapes that we provide that depends on what the city wants to achieve. Now, what we say, the biggest hurdle for cities 
to become smarter is the cost. So yes, you can invest in lots of smart activities in the city, whether that's traffic management, parking, lighting, um, providing Wi-Fi, but there's a cost associated to this, and that means you need to start choosing. What we're saying is, well, here you go. Here is a smartscape that provides you record-breaking Wi-Fi, one gigabit, um, and you can interact with it, and it's all paid through advertising. The city gets part of that revenue, hasn't got to pay anything. So it allows itself to move forward, become smarter, get ready for the digitization. And that's the use case for not replacing the phone booth necessarily, because it still gives them that interactivity, still provides them that connectivity through the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And how about tourism? Very good question. So these devices become very much locally aware. So through the applications, you're able to search about things that what do you have around you. So as a tourist, you can find out what, what's about this building. Um, why is this street famous? Uh, what else can I do around here? I need to eat somewhere. I need to sleep somewhere. Um, even multimodal transportation hub information. So as the millennials are much less likely to own a car than old people like myself, they might want to take a different way of transportation. And yes, you can do a lot of things on your mobile phone, but this is really locally aware. So it knows where the next zip car is or the car to go or where the next bicycle is that you can rent. And you can probably, moving forward, when we see the apps develop, even book it right there and then uh, on one of these smartscapes. But I could also sit on a park bench near one of your kiosks and watch Netflix. Absolutely. During my lunch hour. Yes. Just, it's not been rolled out in Central Park yet in New York, but... Well, there might be a park bench near sure. a kiosk, not in Central Park. Yes, but. absolutely, you can do My that. point is, the fact that you're providing public Wi-Fi is also a differentiator in that it extends beyond the actual use of the kiosk. It, it emanates yes. and, and provides that halo around it, right? And, and that provides in a, a network, uh, a platform maybe you might want to call it, through which we can offer lots of other services. So there are about, I, I, last time I looked, there's over 400 parking solution apps that you can download um, that will tell you where's the best parking app. Now, one big challenge is how do you pay for it? Some cities have a solution for that. Well, you can use that network. We don't want to make a parking app, but you can use the network to actually enable some of this. And the city can take control if necessary to make sure that you get a good experience. The same with traffic management, the same with finding out what's the microclimate around where I am. Because great thing is, it's there on your street corner and the Wi-Fi enables you to make that connectivity. Now I, let's say I want to use one of your kiosks uh, and it's nighttime. These things are bright. They create their own light. They create their own lighting or is there lighting to enhance the use of that kiosk? So there are some small LED lights so that you can see the panels, um, but they also have, of course, the advertising panels are lit up. So would you like Philips to light your uh, kiosk for you? They're more than welcome to do that. So in fact, I can imagine a scenario where light post and digital signage come together. No? In connected bus stops, of course. Yeah, sure. And the together. other thing about the bus stops and the locally aware, excellent point on the locally aware, Erwin, to just to add to that, is in bridging the digital divides in cities, then they're looking at can you sit in front in that bus stop and say, here's the bus route, where are jobs along this bus stop? Because I desperately need a job and I don't have a car. Where is alternate housing along this bus stop? Because I need to live where I can get to a job. So you start seeing the merge of community issues that cities care a lot about in bridging that digital divide with these sort of multi-use street furnitures coming together in a way that have never been thought of before. And part of what we do together with uh, our partnership, like with uh, AT&T, if it's okay to say, they're very keen on how to enable um, innovation, right? And so imagine you now al allow these bus stops with the various capabilities to have an, an innovation system where you have uh, universities or third parties creating apps that would be relevant for that local community, right? And visible on that touch screen. Mm -hmm. These are some of the, I think what we'll see happening is convergence always is happening, 
but always when it's the benefit to the benefit of the citizens and the visitors to that community as well as providing some sort of benefit to the ones that are owning these systems, right? Mm. Maybe so an Jim, interesting use case, uh, we actually also developed uh, a system for Columbia University in New York. So you have the streetwear yeah. and you have Columbia University. The apps are very different because the university has very specific requirements. These go on campus, you're saying? These go on campus, they are on campus. So they want to see it differently than when you go out. But there is a connectivity that we are now bringing so that when you leave the campus, you still stay within this, OK, well, here is your car or here is the bus. Uh, so it, it merges out and brings pieces together. And what I'm seeing maybe in the near future is a convergence of streetwear. Yep. So there's lots of streetwear out there, one to pay your parking meter, uh, one to turn on the lights, one to manage traffic. But what if you? are measuring traffic flow and then automatically send a message to the traffic light, stay green or go red earlier, so that it becomes much more ambiguous than what it is today. Or for that matter, you know, the bus schedule that's part of your uh, bus shelter says the buses are running behind because the lights aren't synchronized. Uh, how do we motivate <laughs> Yes. <laughs> or, or what we're... What we're doing down in uh, South America is the buses, though, get prioritized treatment through yeah, the, exactly. those streets because they're carrying the high bandwidth number of people, right? So, so all these types of convergence are very interesting, very interesting. Jim? Well, Jim. I was just going to say, in, in, in Chicago, we present in, in, uh, in cooperation with the Transit Authority, we present here's bus number four, this is when it's going to arrive, here's you know, bus number 18, at a particular stop. So uh, a, a traveler or a resident, a citizen, can look right up at the bus shelter and see. How long am I going to wait? How here? long am I going to wait? Is it four minutes? Do I have time minutes? to watch or? Netflix? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, but, and I think uh, I'd just like to say something, because we, we talk a lot about use cases. Um, but the, the, the way that uh, you actually deploy requires a lot of capabilities on the city side. And we heard from L, for example, where, where the city specifically put experts in place with a, with a mission. And uh, for us, it's so important to find these partners in the city mm -hmm. and develop the process how to deploy, how to permit, how to plan. Mm -hmm. And um, so the business model goes far beyond the use case and the solution itself, which is, uh, for example, our integrated light pole but it's also the way to engage the city in the process of designing and deploying. And, and so uh, from all the different departments that, that you know, we talk to, everybody has an interest in the network or in the asset or in the sensors, and it's important that it all comes together. So one of the hidden use cases that often is not talked about is uh, surveillance, mm -hmm. um, the ability then to monitor that bus station for safety, mm -hmm. to know who's been at that bus station, and to extend the grid of cameras that the cities are deploying. Mm -hmm. Is that built into any of your equipment that you're talking about? Absolutely, mm -hmm. of course. Safety is actually one of the number one priorities that connected bus stops are happening more and more, right? Because there's always a driver, a business driver that that pushes why they're going to invest in doing something, and safety is one of the, the main issues. And How lighting is actually one of the best policemen, as one former uh, New exactly. York mayor once said, and yep. uh, uh, that is something that we drive very hard, and it's actually not only the light level in one spot, it's actually the, the homogeneous lighting to avoid dark spots, and uh, that avoids actually crime uh, to a large extent. So we're not necessarily promoting directly surveillance, we're promoting actually um, safe, well-lit streets to, to avoid this situation. But you could provide could. the camera uh, housings. Actually, one, one interesting use case I just heard about uh, down in Florida is, um, is uh, for example, uh, you know, dumping, you know, basically illegal dumping in, on, on somewhere in the city, you know, a dump site is created and then, oh, somebody comes along, oh, somebody created a dump site here, but put more stuff there. And the city required to, to put basically mobile surveillance units when this happened. But they, they can't deploy them in thousands across the city, to, to, so they have to mo move them around. So they, they rely on LTE networks to make that happen. But you need to have LTE networks that support full 
HD streaming when something happens. And uh, you need to have devices that actually put logic in the cloud, so they need to be always on and connected. And um, that is a perfect use case to let mobile operators or, let's say, carriers build out the networks and then allow others to build the applications. And so we, we see as much as an enabler, like we are with the lighting, we enable others, like a surveillance use case. I, I think in the uh, procurement process that cities often use to procure, uh, to get advertising uh, concessions and, and the like, is we've seen recently specific requirements along the lines of uh, security monitoring or other capabilities and, and what's helpful about that is there's a lot of work that the city's done to help prioritize what they think is important relative to the all the different programs they have. The question then becomes is how do you rationalize that to provide a good cost-effective program but um, we've, we've recently responded that that among other requirements in a particular city that we're negotiating a final agreement with. And uh, another example is uh, in, in, a, in a different city where there are, where, where we've been the concessionaire for uh, bus shelters, the city also had poles that indicated there's, it's a bus stop, but it was, you know, it wasn't a shelter, it was a, sure, a, a pole, and this exists, and it's, it may have been okay, but in the, in a new concession to replace the prior one, we're looking to double the, the number of bus shelters and they would be more, let's say, uh, more advanced bus shelters that provide multiple capabilities that we're talking about. So there's, there's a significant, th this public-private partnership that, that Brenda and others have referred to is, is essential here and it's essential to do, do the work uh, well as much on the front end but allow for innovation o over the time of the concession. So the last questions I want to ask, and I'm going to allow a number of you to co comment on it, is what is the role of so-called cloud uh, infrastructure and architectures in all this? Um, I'm guessing you have some kind of management system yeah. for the lighting. Um, I imagine that you have the ability to control the images on the screen in a cloud-based yeah. content system. Um, I don't know what exactly the cloud is behind the kiosks, um, and I could ask you about the role of Google if we have Android uh, being the operating system, but I'm going to guess that cloud is a big factor here, that somewhere there's this environment behind these various connectivity systems. So why don't you describe how cloud fits into all this? And since I didn't pick on you yet, Brenda, start with you. You haven't picked on me yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I made you sit right there, didn't I? So cloud is an absolute important, and, and it's not just cloud, it's clouds of clouds or systems of systems. Because, for example, Philips have light poles, and then they have a cloud that takes care of their light poles, right? Civic have a, a, a kiosk, and they have a cloud that take care of their kiosks. And same for J.C. Duco. They have a devices and they have a cloud that takes care of their devices. And then when you want to sort of provide value across their clouds, there's a cloud above them which knits the value across the silo. So it's a system of systems approach in the cloud, if you can even imagine that. Right? Yeah, and one of and them so, will give us rain if we need it. And one of them will <laughs> give us rain, yes. I think it's more, it's more fog than cloud, uh, if I can say that, in the sense that it's the Cisco it's, fog, or it's the well, it's not any particular brand of, of fog, but I'm just <laughs> suggesting, not that there's anything wrong with branding fog, but uh, it's more the localization of the of the management of the information yes. that's consistent with the uh, the the mores of the of the community that's negotiated with the city, particularly where there's a concession involved and there's security requirements and so yeah, forth. So it's so not always a top-down. There's not always a top. In fact. We, we look at it very differently, but not all, uh, ver there are very few digital advertising assets relative to the base of advertising assets that exist in the world. Very few of them are digital, but the transition to digital is dramatic in, in our business and I'm sure in other businesses. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm, I tend to look at the entire architecture 
when I look at uh, light, central lighting management systems, in the past they have been architected around uh, proprietary mesh networks or power line based systems, very faulty and, and hard to maintain uh, with local servers that, that have not been updated over time. And, and the issue with cities is that they think in decades, right? I mean, the street light has to be out there. A pole is out there for up to 100 years. You know, a luminaire is out there for 40 years. You change the lamp. Now with LED, it goes in longer cycles, even 15 years before you have to go back and repair it. So actually, the cloud enables us to deploy a system today that does all the beautiful things that they need to do according to today's requirements. But with the cloud, we grow that capability over time, and nobody has to upgrade any system. But you know, in order to make the secure connection, we actually believe strongly in cellular networks or managed wireless access. So going away from proprietary mesh networks that the city have to maintain to actually managed quality of service networks, and that's why our lighting control system is actually cellular enabled and hops on the next available network. So we eat, in a way, our own dog food of the networks that we're helping to deploy. Cool. So um, I'm going to ask the same thing of this panel as I did the previous panel. Can I get a explain oh, I'm how sorry. it works You didn't get to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, because you were, you were uncertain on how I'm, we do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we actually deployed three different things. As every um, Smartscape is linked to a fiber, so that's one way we can communicate to it. Um, the other way is, of course, via the cloud, and we need remote management so of the devices, one for emergency messages, for example, flooding, storms, whatever might happen. Uh, other is, of course, to change whatever advertising is being shown, and that may be unique to a specific area. Um, but beyond that, we also deploy edge computing, because certain things don't have time to go back into the cloud to make the site whether or not the traffic light should be red or green or what should happen in emergency situations. So it is self-aware as well and uses a local computer in case the whole network goes down means it can still operate, uh, but also it can be much faster in responding to certain situations. So you have a cloud inside the kiosk as well as outside the kiosk? Well, just outside. We have wires inside. You have wires inside. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay, good. So. Uh, thank you very much, by the way. I'm sorry I neglected to ask you the question. Um, I'm going to ask the same for this panel as the previous one. Because the next session the, would be of interest to you, and they would be interested in hearing and, and you getting feedback from you later, I'd appreciate if you could stay with us and uh, uh, be part of the next session. And one of the things I'm going to ask you is, uh, if a company wanted to know all of the potential small cell locations that your technology could enable and could put them in a database so the carriers could then be aware of the possibility of locating a small cell there. Would you cooperate with that? Think about the answer to that question. We do Thank already. Thank you very much. Yes? You're saying yes or no? Yes, we do already. You already do. Okay, We're doing cool. it. We, we already do. You already do. Plus, no we problem. provide it directly to the operators as yeah. well. Okay, yes. cool. Very good. Thank That's you very much, so. guys.